morning, everybody. Um, I hope everybody's doing okay today. Today is the second to last day of our seven part lecture series called Deconstructing Racism, organized by GCC's Social Science Division, the Associated Students of Glendale Community College and Student Equity. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to learn as a community uh, in the hopes that education drives us to action. So before we begin, I have a few announcements. Um, first of all, we have interpretation and closed captioning services available tonight for our deaf and hard of hearing attendees. You have the option of pinning the interpreters by clicking on the three dots on the box where their faces can be found. You can also follow along with the closed captioning. Um, a transcript will be saved after the event. Um, this lecture will be recorded and published on glendale.edu slash anti-racism at a later date. Um, that link will be put in the chat. We will be having a one and a half hour lecture on deconstructing racism, the push for progress at, at GCC, followed by a 30 minute Q&A. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, for GCC students only, we will have a healing circle open immediately after this event, led by GCC counselors to provide students with a safe space to discuss and process the heavy topics that have been covered by over the course of this series. A separate link will be set in the chat. So um, my name is Lise Dulai and I am the incoming Vice President of Administration for the Associated Students of Glendale Community College. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our speakers today. Kayla Regalado, our outgoing Vice President of Administration for ASGCC. Sydney Saragoza, the Vice President of GCC's Black Student Union. Riley, the president of Black Student Union, Hoover Zariani, the director of GCC's Multicultural and Community Engagement Center. So thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to just say thank you to ASGCC, to the Social Science Division, uh, and everyone really who's made this possible. I have attended every single one, so I, I actually learned quite a bit. And I want to thank you for joining us. Um, today, let me go to my, okay. I really, really didn't know what to call this uh, presentation. So I kind of threw everything in there uh, in the hopes that I'll capture, um, hopefully in a very uh, methodical way, uh, where we were, where we started as far as education and systems of oppression, uh, and I would argue cultural genocide, um, where we are now uh, as far as what steps is GCC taking to address some of the things. Of course we are, and by no means am I trying to say that we're done with doing the work. Uh, but there's a lot more that we still need to do. So um, hopefully we'll hit all those things. And so today's agenda, just very quickly, um, I want to take a little bit time to talk about where does the knowledge about our world come from? Uh, so who uh, wrote the knowledge that we have? Uh, how has education, and we have to be critical of ourselves, how has education been historically used to oppress different groups? Uh, then there's a quiz, don't panic, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, and then looking at education through the critical race theory, which for some people it's um, obvious what it is, uh, especially faculty members, and for others, it might be a whole new idea. And there are some things that I'm going to present overall today that people may have a resistance to. So just pay attention to your own uh, self consciousness. When you have resistance, just ask yourself why you have that resistance. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, racism and why we need to talk about it just very briefly. It's obvious to most people, but I kind of did research on probably the three most obvious uh, reasons why we don't like to talk about race and racism. Um, 
And then, as I said, what is GCC currently doing to address race, diversity, and equity? And then we'll talk about a survey that the college uh, participated in as a campus, uh, a student survey that is done through uh, USC. And we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so yesterday, or was it the day before, uh, we had a presentation by two professors, history, and Professor Stoness said this, and I, as soon as she said it, I kind of grabbed it because I thought, oh, perfect for my presentation. Uh, because as she mentioned, um, history is written by those who have, who have the power at the time. I think I'm correctly uh, quoting her. Um, this is a really important point because when we start to look at everything that we know, all the knowledge that we have historically uh, comes from somewhere, right? It didn't just appear. So uh, I don't know if anyone uh, knows or has read John Walensky's Adventure in Learning, uh, where he talks about different types of education. He writes a lot about multicultural education. Um, so I thought from this uh, one book of his, sorry, I'm trying to, okay. From uh, one of his books, um, I found this quote to, a couple of quotes that I think kind of demonstrates uh, how we kind of got to where we are, our origins. Um, so he's talking about Bay uh, history, needs to include imperialism's influence through Europe's age of exploration and the Renaissance, the founding of the colonies, the enlightenment, the opening of the Pacific, and the rise of Romanticism, the Victorian age, and the scramble for Africa. So what he's trying to say is that in the next quote, it makes it a little bit uh, more clearer. So we need to consider the project of mapping and naming everything in the world, right? And it was done by those who colonized other countries, mostly white Anglo uh, population, and they brought it within a single system of thought. Now, I don't know if people have thought about this, but um, what could be wrong with a single system of thought? Um, well, one of, it's problematic because there are other systems of thought. So who are we leaving out, leaving behind in um, conversations and in really participation in society? when we are listening to a single system of thought. Um, and he says that it was actually like with pleasure that these men and women uh, who detailed the world uh, for the West um, brought it into an imperial order of things, imperial, colonial. Um, and this, what they did was dictate all the future generations, all everything we were going to learn for hundreds of years, right? So when colonists went to other countries, they found species of animals, of plants, of different um, species of everything, and they named it. So a lot of the world that we know now is really named and it's still applicable from colonial times. So that's kind of uh, where I think our origins of um, what we know kind of comes from. Um, I want to go on a little side tangent, um, but I think it'll come back to uh, the main point. But a language is very important, as a lot of academicians know. Um, but there is language, there's problems with language and how we identify ourselves and others, right? So I put a couple of examples here. Um, Black, African-American, and American of African descent. So I've had people who said to me, like, 
don't identify me as black or don't identify me as African American. And the last one, American uh, of African descent, is actually something I just um, kind of learned from one of our faculty members. I didn't know that was a way of identifying. Um, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic, Chicano, Chicana, Ch Chicanx. Um, with Latinx, there's a lot of problems. A lot of people don't like it. I actually do use it quite a bit because I think it's a way of non-gendering uh, the population that you're discussing. So if you're offended, it's not because I'm trying to offend you, but it's just um, what I have used. And um, I have conversations with people that, who don't like that term. And then we get to Asian American, which personally, and I've read a lot that the community also thinks it's problematic, right? Um, so what I want to do, I should have done, is pop out the chat option so I can actually ask you all to kind of participate. Um, let me give me one second. I should have done that before. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I'll go back to screen. So if anyone, no, my chat option, I think this appears. Yeah, it's not here. When I go to share my screen. Um, sorry. So what I'm going to do is just um, ask people based on the slide, uh, what could be problematic? And if you can type it in the chat box under my name, so you can direct it to me so I can actually read the uh, comments, um, is what could be problematic with the phrase Asian American? Can anyone take a wild guess? Anyone? No? Ah. Ah, very good. Uh, there are 52 countries in Asia, right? So that's important. That's acknowledging the other countries. Um, assumes that Asian American is a monolith, when in fact there are Asian Americans from all those 52 countries, most likely here. It's a broad uh, uh, designation. Uh, they're all very different cultures and languages. Uh, lumps everyone's experience, cultural experiences into one categories, ignores differences, um, etc. So very good. Uh, my next slide, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen so it's bigger and you can see it better. Right? So a lot of people laugh at me when I say I'm Asian. Um, not like laugh in my face, but kind of smile, like you're not Asian. But if we look at the countries of Asia, like someone mentioned, there are 52. I come from Iran, right? I was born there. And um, in, Iran is in Asia. So is Russia. So is Iraq. So is Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, right? So all of these are also Asian countries. This looks like an old school map, but it's not. It's a pretty current. So what happens is, yes, we have our traditional understanding of Asian, which actually I would argue um, is somewhat racist because we are basing it on appearance, right? We're not basing it on where people are from. If we were, then we would call all those people Asian. Except, uh, what do we call people from this area of the country or the world, sorry? Uh, we generally call them uh, Middle Eastern, right? But you would be maybe surprised if you haven't lived there that there is no such thing as Middle East in the Middle East. 
people don't refer to themselves as Middle Eastern. So who came up with that term? Does anyone know? Who named the world, right? Who decided that that's what we're going to call that part of the world? So, and I'm using Wikipedia, but there are many other sources that you can verify this information. The term Middle East actually came from the British India office. India was a colony of Britain for a while, uh, for a long while. Um, however, it became more widely known when a naval strategist, American, used the term. And he was trying to refer to the area between uh, Arabia and India. So again, who named the world? Why is that important? Um, how does that help people identify in one way or another? So that's kind of important to recognize, I think. Um, if your ideas are being challenged, that's okay. Stay with it, stay with me, don't go away. Uh, I'm gonna keep checking time because I wanna make sure I don't, I leave enough time for our other speakers. Um, the next thing I wanna just mention historically and this is, um, let me do the slideshow here so it's bigger. So here is uh, what generally education has been used um, to when countries have been colonized, including our country, United States. And a lot of my material actually comes from, is it backwards or? Can you see it? This book, which is uh, by Joel Spring, I have the reference at the end on the last page. So uh, Spring talks about six different ways that colonization, educational methods were used when countries are colonized. Uh, first one being cultural genocide. So cultural genocide, it's pretty self-explanatory, unfortunately. It's an attempt to destroy the culture of a dominated uh, group. Uh, so Native Americans were subject to cultural genocide, as we know, Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, and other groups, right? So it's to totally destroy the culture that's being dominated. There's also this concept of deculturalization. Um, and this probably happens more than we even think about. Uh, so that's basically the educational process of destroying a people's culture and replacing it with a new one. And language plays a really important part um, of that, uh, of culture. And again, groups that have been historically affected, uh, almost all immigrant groups. Um, but I, I'll share a little bit, and I didn't know until I realized this uh, concept and term exists. When I came here, I was around 11 years old, and I knew no English. Um, and what they did was they told me, you're not going to speak English. We're not going to really teach you in English because it was an immersion program. So it was not dual language learning. So there was no support for me in my native language. And um, I think that's okay at that age for a certain amount of time. But what happened is I learned that um, my language is not acceptable, that it's not the dominant language and that I need to stop speaking my language. So for years and years, I would say even up to now, I lost a lot of my language skills. Uh, people would laugh at me when I would try to speak Armenian. I totally forgot my uh, second language that I had learned, which is Farsi. But uh, along with language went a lot of cultural things, right? Uh, so that's an example I think a lot of our uh, students experience. Uh, we can also talk about the uh, uh, walkouts in East LA. Uh, that was part of the reason of the walkouts because those uh, Latinx, Chicano, Hispanic students were <clears throat> being denied their culture. 
Uh, assimilation is another way uh, of colonizing uh, through education. So these are education programs that absorb and integrate cultures into the dominant culture. In United States, obviously, most schools use um, assimilation. And some people think of it negatively, and I would argue there's definitely a way to think of it otherwise, right? Uh, cultural pluralism, uh, education program designed to maintain the language and culture of each group. So they kind of live side by side, uh, the two cultures, the individual has to experience. Uh, denial of education also is another way. And obviously experienced by African Americans, Mexican Americans, Native Americans, and Chinese Americans. And if you don't think historically Chinese Americans were discriminated against, actually in California, they were designated as black. So they could not go to white schools. They would send them to black schools, which were obviously at that time, like way worse funded and not equal. And then we have the term hybridity, which is a term to describe cultural changes resulting from intersection of two different cultures. Uh, and by that, most, almost I would argue like 99% of immigrants experience hybridity. Uh, that's when you have your culture at home, but you also have to interact with the culture of the outside world. So you learn how to uh, kind of balance the two and you basically it's a hybrid of two different cultures. So you know how to function. Okay, now you didn't come here for a quiz, but you're gonna have to take one. And I think I'm gonna uh, stop the share at that point. Well, does he need me to make you host? Yes. Okay, let me go ahead and do that. So you can take care of the polling. Um, um, um. I'm reading some of the comments. Yes, yes. Okay, I just made you host. Can you go uh, ahead and make me co-host? Uh, you're ASGCC, right? I changed my name to Kayla. To oh, my... you did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, participants. Let me make sure. Okay. Here is co host. Okay, great. So let me see. I'm not seeing the option pop up of the poll. Um, it should be on the bottom of your screen. Yeah. You may have to click more. Ah. Uh. And we thought we had this figured out. I apologize. <laughs> um, it's okay, we're all learning how to use Zoom still. <laughs> okay, it's not uh, popping up anywhere. I tried several places, but that's okay. I'm just gonna informally ask the questions. Uh, that's why it's important to be prepared. Um, and uh, people can uh, respond in the chat box if uh, you know, but, um, or yes or no, these are yes or no uh, questions. So, and I'm asking the question in a specific way because I'm trying to see about your formal education, not informally or what you learned outside of school. So, um, if, it's a yes, please type in uh, the box yes. If it's a no, you don't need to answer because, well, you'll see. So as part of middle school or high school curriculum, think about it, just as part of your middle school or high school, were you taught about the mass deportation of 2 million Mexican Americans, many of whom were actually American citizens, during the 1930s and 40s from the United States? If yes, type in yes in the box. 
Ah, we have one yes. Okay, all so far, mostly no's. Okay, uh, and that is true, actually. So let me go to my web browser. So actually, there were two million, uh, some Americans who were deported during the 1930s and the 40s. And let me share the screen to show you. So here's a picture of, I believe this is the Union Station. And they were organized, so there was mass deportation of Mexicans and Mexican Americans, up to 2 million. And um, this was obviously during like um, depression time and when the economy wasn't good. And can anyone guess what was the reason they gave for the deportation? It's something you hear to this day. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can. Taking jobs, exactly. Mexicans, even Mexican Americans, were taking jobs away from Americans, right? So um, it's an old, age old kind of thing that has happened 30s and 40s. And of course, we kind of have that now with ICE. So unfortunately, history repeats itself. Um, so let me ask the next question. I'm just going to stay on that page. So as part of middle school or high school curriculum, were you taught about the Federal Housing Administration laws that explicitly excluded housing loans to black Americans until 1968. That's 1968. Anyone, if you can answer yes or no, if you don't, if you weren't taught. I'm seeing mostly no's, one yes. There's one person who's learned everything, which is excellent. We should all know these things. So again, most people are responding no. And let me go to my, so this is from the Atlantic. And those housing policies still have an impact on where African Americans and Blacks live now, today, right? It helped shape our entire communities. And all of these references, I have them at the end. But what would also happen, it's called redlining. I think they mentioned this a few times over the last week. But what would happen is the red areas, right? They wouldn't make loans to, well, they wouldn't make loans, period, to anyone who lived in those communities because they were majority African American. But what would also happen is if you were on the border of one of those, if you were trying to buy a home in the border of one of those redlined areas, they still may not give you a loan, even if you weren't African American, because it was close to a black community. So this history, still with us, this article minus the ads, um, kind of um, outlines what happened there. Okay, okay, let me go to, I'm seeing comments, redlining and sundown towns also existed in Glendale. Glendale, yes, used to be a sundown town. Uh, if people don't know, that means no uh, African American or black people could be in Glendale after sundown. And I think you had to have a note or something of that kind that you were working as a domestic person for, uh, um, someone who lived in Glendale. Someone said my screen sharing is off, which I do this often, but I will share because I want you all to see, sorry about that, this example there, sorry. So this is the map of example 
California in one area. I think it's up in the Bay Area. Okay, let's go to our next question. So as part of your uh, middle school or high school curriculum, if you went to school, particularly in California, were you taught that schools in California were segregated, like whites only, uh, and then other groups? until the Mendez versus Westminster lawsuit, which was in 1947. Who uh, knew this fact? And I'll stop sharing just to see. A few people, okay, better, yes, definitely. Okay, and someone said they didn't go to school here, but in England they didn't tell uh, much about any of these kind of uh, things happening. So let me share the screen. Here. So actually, Sylvia Mendez is the student, that's her as an um, adult, who actually her parents sued uh, and it went to the California Supreme Court and they actually won the lawsuit. And she even has a stamp named in her honor. And this was in 1947. When was Brown versus Board of Education? Do people know? Does anyone know? 1954, exactly. So this was seven years before Brown versus Edu uh, Board of Education. So it was the prelude to outlying separate but equal schooling for a lot of people. And I'll do one more. Um, okay, so as part of your uh, middle school or high school curriculum, were you taught about the 1968 LA, uh, East LA walkouts and demands made by Latino, Latina, Latinx students in Los Angeles in your schooling? Okay, I'm just getting all no's. Obviously, this poll is fixed, right, by me, uh, to kind of gauge what are the things we are not being taught, right? And this is our history, right? At least California state history. Um, let me share the screen so I can show you this. I have more questions, but I'm gonna move on. From these. So um, high school students actually, and that was the start of like Chicano power, 1968 walked out from five high schools. And I teach students who are from those high schools, not here at Cal State LA. And when I asked them about the walkouts, they went to, for example, here it says Garfield High School, but they're not taught about the history of that school even. So they didn't even know that students were involved in such a uh, big action, right? So we're not even educating our own students who come from those communities. And that's problematic, right? Denial of education in a way. Um, I also had a couple of other things here. Uh, in California, Santa Monica Beach, uh, they were segregated beaches. So African-Americans actually had to fight to uh, be able to enjoy the beach, right? And I can't remember, uh, read about Bruce's beach if you get a chance to. I can't remember what year it became desegregated. 1912 maybe, Manhattan Beach, around that time. Uh, the other thing we don't hear at all is about LGBTQ people. And right here in Silver Lake, uh, the Black Cat Tavern, uh, there were raids on LGBTQ um, residents uh, in a bar, right? And this was in 1966, right? And does anyone know when Stonewall happened, which is the most commonly known uh, riots uh, for LGBTQ people? It was 1968. Right, so this is before, right here in Los Angeles. This is before that. So um, 
there was one sign. Oh, I was like very proud of this sign because they used the term stormtroopers, which reminds me of Star Wars. But that person was way ahead of uh, their time, I think. And here's the like uh, demonstrations against Silver Lake Sunset and Hyperion, if you've ever gone there. So this is just to show us how much history we don't know. So who writes our history still? Anyone? Anyone? Do you know who writes our textbooks? That one I don't have an answer, but someone put a question mark. White men, question mark. Elite whites, question mark. Right? This is why there is such a push to have the voices and stories and narratives of people of color, all people, um, be heard, right? Uh, but generally publishers uh, are the ones in the, uh, who have the power to publish certain things. Are we doing on time? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go a little faster, but I think it was important to kind of look at that history. We're still not learning what we need to be learning. How do we get there? We demand, right? So let me go back to my PowerPoint. Thank you for indulging the quiz. Everyone passed, I'll just say. And share screen. Oh wait, sharing screen is disabled. Can you enable my screen share? Thank you, Kayla. Okay, so uh, the other thing I definitely want to cover is this concept of critical race theory. So there's uh, something called critical theory, but um, what happened was everyone kind of adapted it to their field. I think originally it was in law, but it expanded to other fields. And it's just a theoretical framework of how you look at things. And that's just a fancy way of saying your view how you view certain things. So a quick definition of uh, critical race theory. And I put nice in quotes because this is very simple and I'm not gonna do it justice, but I think it's important that we at least look at it. Um, so critical race theory, CRT, asks us to consider how we can transform the relationship between race, racism, and power, and work toward the liberation of people of color. So I say nice, because I'm gonna give you the not so nice definition. This is more, I think, like how I think of it, and more in your face. So what critical race theory assumes, right, is that law, legal institutions are inherently racist, right? <clears throat> that we see racism as a natural thing, but it's a socially co constructed concept, which many of the speakers this week have been talking about. It's a man-made concept, right? And it's used by white people to further their own economic and political interests at the expense of people of color. So according to CRT, CRT Racial inequality emerges from the social, economic, and legal differences that white people create between races. And that's in quotes, because there really is no such thing as a race. Um, to maintain elite white interests in labor markets and politics, giving rise then to poverty and criminality in minority communities. So it's, kind of really saying our whole society, every system you look at is racist. And we have to work to make it not so. Um, again, I'm not saying by my or this theory, but I just want us to start looking at it from that lens so we can hopefully see how at least education or wherever everyone else is um, from, institutions are, uh, how racism operates, okay? So uh, Terry Yoso uh, wrote an amazing article about cultural community wealth. And in it, she outlines actually a lot of things. It's a kind of 
uh, thick, um, I would say, reading. Uh, not as in thick, but like deep. Uh, but she also talks about uh, critical race theory and applying it to education, right? Um, so CRT, and this is in this article, which I have a citation at the end of the presentation. So I'm happy to share the PowerPoint and the citation. And when you see citations here, that's who she is citing. Um, for her definitions. Um, so race and racism are central, endemic, permanent, and fundamental part of defining and explaining how U.S. society functions. Okay, she's coming from this CRT view. So CRT acknowledges there are layers of racialized subordination, which also consider gender, class, immigration status, surname, phenotype, accent, and sexuality. And here we see Crenshaw again cited um, as she was several times. So um, another part, uh, important part of critical race theory is that it challenges white privilege. And it also is very uh, critical of education, right? that education says they're colorblind, they're race neutral, they're equal opportunity, uh, opportunistic. But if you look at it from a critical uh, race theory, it says they're not. That education is trying to perpetuate what it always has, which is status quo, right? So she's actually an educator herself. So she's critiquing education, right? Um, and saying that these interests are camouflaged for self-interest, power, and privilege of dominant groups. That's how it's used. Um, and then reaffirming what CRT is committed to, which is social justice and liberation of people um, in response to racial, gender, and class oppression, right? Um, so it's working toward elimination of racism, sexism, poverty, right? Because racism doesn't function by itself. It has these horrible brothers and sisters and cousins of sexism, uh, homophobia, etc. These are all parts of subordinated groups that she's mentioning here. Um, this is really important because when we do Western type research, right, or scholarly research, um, the experiences of people of color are not seen as legitimate often. I'm not saying everywhere and this is changing, but generally speaking, they are not, right? So what she's saying, CRT is saying out loud, that people of color, uh, their experiences, their knowledge is legitimate, appropriate, and critical to understanding and analyzing uh, teaching about subordination. Um, and these are often, again, academically, not seen as valid ways of um, looking at people's experiences. So what she's saying is CRT says they are valid. Storytelling, family histories, biographies, scenarios, parables, cuentos, which is kind of tales, uh, testimonials, testimonials, and narratives that people put together based on their family history. I can tell you my family's stories about the genocide because my great grandparents uh, and uncles were involved in genocide. Uh, they were killed in the genocide. So that's a family story. But often in academics, we don't informal uh, research. We don't look at that as a valid thing. Um, and then uh, transdisciplinary, that we don't look at one thing from just one point of view, right? We have to look at it through multiple lenses, like ethnic studies, women's studies, sociology, history, law, psychology, film, theater. Those are all valid fields that we need to look at. Uh, 
So just getting quickly to, I'm looking at time. When I'm looking on the side, I'm just checking time to make sure I give enough time for our students to share. So it's not that I don't wanna be here and I needed to say that in the beginning. Um, so why we don't teach about or talk about race and racism. I did a lot of research, I've done it before. Um, and these are the three things that come up most often, right? So fear of race. Many people, if they've had an experience with racism or race, it was not a good experience and they don't feel comfortable talking about it. So just a fear of talking about race. And as many people have said during this past week, it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to have to confront it and talk about it because we're not, this is not two weeks ago. Things have changed, right? A um, lot of people say, and this is a pet peeve when they say it, I don't see color, right? So the problem with that is that if you don't see color or you don't see my color, um, quote unquote, you're not acknowledging my whole history, right? That you're not seeing color. So there, it's problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, and then we have people uh, who claim raceless consciousness, right? So consciousness of people of color is very different from uh, white population because of the racist experiences that people of color have gone through. So our consciousness about race is very different, right? Some people may not see it because they've never had to interact with it or deal with it. Uh, and others have had a lot of experiences. I think you're gonna probably hear some of that a little later. So um, what, why do we need to talk, teach about race? So what I did was, I'm gonna stop share. I'm doing okay on time. I'm just telling myself that. Um, but I want to share that. Okay, let me go here and share my screen. So I went to the California State Board of Education to look at the content standards and this is public website, so anyone can go. And you can see they have um, different uh, standards for different areas. So I figured in history or social science, I can look at those and see where racism is taught or race-related issues. So I'm not going to do it now, but when I opened it, it's 55 pages of standards from first grade to 12th grade. The word race was mentioned once in the whole document. There's a lot about different cultures, etc., but racism wasn't even mentioned, and race was mentioned once. This is California. This is our history and social science standards for K through 12. There's something wrong there, right? So we're not doing the work we need to do with our younger students. Uh, that's why many of you didn't know all the stuff that I was sharing. Um, why we have to talk about racism, right? I'm going to share this. Hold on, sorry. Share screen. This is why it's important to talk about race and racism. So this is a hate map. I know, fun times, right? Um, and don't think just because a state doesn't have a dot that it doesn't have hate groups. So the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center actually tracks hate groups. And in 2019, they tracked 940 different hate groups that exist in the United States. So here's obviously California. The neat thing about this is if you click on a, it's very interactive map, on a state, you can see how many hate groups exist in that state. And if you click on the little dots, some of them you can't get to because they're so like 
converged over each other. It'll tell you what um, basically that group is. So there are things I've never heard of. Right brand clothing, right? No one would guess that's a hate group, but they are. Uh, and I know people will have issues with the Southern Poverty Law Center, but they've been doing this for years and they track hate crimes actually. Uh, they have a national registry. So everywhere in the United States, right? Everywhere, nowhere, even Alaska or Hawaii, right? And you can filter by ideology, different things. But this is why we have to talk about race, right? There are people who are doing this um, hate work um, so how are we going to counter it? Or are we going to counter it, right? So then I don't want to leave you with that negative kind of aspect. So what I also did was I kind of wanted to see what are good things happening right now. So I came across this, Cal State uh, Universities, all of them. They're helping cities. Uh, they're partnering with cities, their local government to meet the needs of the community. So it's a really cool project where students actually get credit for working with the city in different projects. This one is San Diego State University, uh, or yeah, and I think later on UC San Diego, so shout out to them. Um, and it is a learning experience for those students. Another one, this is UCLA. They actually have a community engagement and social change minor that I think almost all students can take any field. Um, and I did meet the person who's the director of this. I think they're working on making it a major as well. So you can take a major in community engagement and social change. So that would be really great. And then I also found the Santa Ana Unified School District actually because of the George Floyd protests and incident, or yeah. Um, they are going to require a one year of ethnic studies for any student to graduate from the district. And sorry about the dead mouse at the bottom, I'll cover that. Um, but yeah, starting in 2022, 23 academic years. Uh, sorry, high school students will be required one year. So there are things happening, right? And I don't want to leave us with a bad kind of uh, taste, but I wanted to just share what is happening at GCC. So we have, and again, by no means am I saying we're done, we have nothing else to do, but we have an awesome ethnic studies program. And here you can see the courses right, listed, uh, Latin, or um, Ethnic Studies 102, Latinos in the US, Contemporary Ethnic Women, European Immigrants, Mexican American Studies, Racial Minorities, uh, Asian American Culture, Asians in America, Japanese Experience, Native American, right, so Armenian, it goes on and on, Restorative Justice Program, Race and Law. And shout out to the Ethnic Studies Department because they've put all of the stuff from this past week uh, already onto the website. So if you missed the lecture, you can actually go there and listen to it. So shout out to them. Um, we have our uh, student equity um, communities, right? So student equity program. But the learning communities, I think it's down here. We have three black scholars, which you're going to hear from a couple of students in a minute, La Comunidad and Guardian Scholars. Uh, La Comunidad is for our Latinx students, black scholars obviously for our black students, and Guardian Scholars is for our former um, I'm blanking out, uh, foster um, youth, uh, former and current actually, uh, foster youth. Uh, 
So we're trying to address uh, communities of students in that way also. Um, we have, actually this should go back one. We have a cultural diversity uh, road to social change program, which is presentations and lectures. Um, if I go back to the learning community, what, I, what else I wanted to share is, I don't see it here, uh, student uh, diversity program, which may be on another page, sorry. We have a program for reentry called Center for Reentry Pathways. This is for formerly incarcerated students. So students who have been to prison, have come out, and again, largely minority population, um, not all, but most. And what we actually do is if we know a student's coming in who is formerly incarcerated, students will do an intake, uh, help them with resources, there's a student club, etc. So that's another population that we work with. And then of course my favorite, because I run the place, um, is the Multicultural and Community Engagement Center. So we engage students in the community um, doing uh, service work, mostly service learning. And if I have a chance, uh, I'm getting close to my time. I will share some student comments, et cetera, from service learning. Uh, but within our center is the Dream Resource Center, which is for undocumented students, dreamers, DACA recipients. And this morning when I heard the news that for now, temporarily, DACA is actually um, okay, that it's safe for now. It was such an amazing feeling because we've been working with these students for the last, I would say 15 years probably, and our dreamers the last few years since it became a law. So we have services, scholarships, how to pay for college, community resource guide, and a pride center for our LGBTQ students, right? And you can visit all of these. We have resources, there's scholarships, there's events. So um, this was done with ASGCC. We have the second annual Pride Week this year and Sex Week and ABCs of LGBTQ, which actually talks about each letter and what is the meaning of that letter, what is that population, etc. And then, oh, and that's pretty much it. I'm gonna stop sharing for Glendale and what we're trying to do. Um, I'm reminding, I guess, everyone to uh, send questions to the, um, under in the chat box to questions, right? And at the end, when we have Q and A, uh, we'll answer all your questions. Um, Kayla, can I do five more minutes? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just okay. let me know when you're ready. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to miss sharing the student comments with you. So. At GCC, I also forgot to mention that we have a Title V grant, which is for Hispanic serving institutions, uh, higher ed institutions that serve at least 25% Latinx students. And through the years, you can see we've had different grants that have tried to develop pathways for STEM, for student success, et cetera. Um, keep going. Student equity, we did all of these. So with service learning, basically the idea is that students will do service in the community that is connected to their coursework. Um, so this is an enhanced way of teaching theories, concepts to students. So what we, we know instinctively, and it's a high impact practice, meaning that it shows great results for students and for the teachers. But every semester we ask students to complete a anonymous survey and we ask them about diversity. So we ask two questions. Did you find yourself in situations where you had to deal with diversity while doing service? And then 
types of diversity? And then do you feel that you gained a greater appreciation of diversity as a result of participating? So pretty much across semesters, here's what the students respond. And this is an anonymous survey, so they're not trying to please anyone. And this is only students who have done some kind of service project in the community. So 91% said they experienced some sort of diverse situation. And 75% of them said that they actually gained a greater appreciation of diversity. And then we asked them if they can to add some comments. So we have obviously a lot of social science folks who are doing this work. And just a few of the comments, I'm not going to read all of them. Um, one of the students in the history class, there was an African American kid and other kids with a different race were afraid to play with him. Once they saw I was talking and playing with him, the others came and socialized. Um, so talk about bridging, like cultures, etc. I learned the difficulty of balancing work and parenting for women and how it differed from men, right? Gender roles, understanding that. This last one, as a Latina, I find it difficult to talk to others who are from different class and race from me. But a woman who was white slash Armenian had deep conversations with me and I began to not judge others as a whole. And you know, I could show you 20 pages of comments. Uh, I was gonna, but I won't, just kidding. Um, so as you can see from the student comments, they gain a lot to actually interact. And again, this is like pre-COVID. Uh, when they interact with people of different cultures or groups. So for us on campus and for the faculty who do this work, it's really important to get our students out there. I think that's a really great way to address a lot of uh, racial and disparities between different types of people. So um, amazing students doing amazing work. Um, let's see, one minute. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but I just wanna let you all know that USC has a race and equity center. It's long established, it's well known. And they, uh, part of their work is to do a assessment of collegiate campus climate. GCC participated in this uh, about, I wanna say a year and a half ago. And what happens is students fill out a survey, the survey is analyzed, and then we are sent some recommendations and there are four sections um, of recommendations. So I'm gonna hopefully maybe in the questions part, I can come back and talk about these a little bit. But as you can see, there's like racial learning and literacy mattering and encounters with racial stress. So our findings kind of conclude some of them. I'm not gonna talk about that because I'm not a statistician. Um, we have someone who uh, is and talks about it very clearly, so I don't want to mess things up. But maybe we'll come back and look at these uh, when we get to the question section. And I just want to leave everyone with this. Um, I think there's a lot of misconception about um, people having to apologize for being white. So what this meme says, I'm just going to read it also for our interpreters. No one's asking you to apologize for being white. No one is asking you to apologize for the sins of your ancestors. What we are asking is that you help dismantle the oppressive systems they built that you still benefit from. So all, I guess, is being asked as far as white privilege uh, is to address these inequalities and inequities um, to create a better world, honestly. Sounds corny, but that's really what we're hoping to do. And I think that's part of why I'm in education. So um, that's it for me. And I'll be here for the question and answer. And I'm going to turn it over to Kayla. Thank you, everyone, for 
sticking with it. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Hoover, for um, that amazing presentation and sharing all those, all that information and all those resources. Um, my name's Kayla Regalado, and as Elise mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Administration for ASGCC. Um, outgoing, I, I'll be leaving <laughs> GCC pretty soon. And I, I just feel really fortunate to be spending my last day in office with Hoover, um, with Sydney and Riley and all of you here discussing um, what has been done here at GCC and how this important work um, can continue. Like Hoover was saying, um, the work is never done. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to um, Sydney and uh, Riley. They can go ahead and introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, Black Student Union as well. Hi everyone, um, thank you guys for attending this um, call and I'm hoping that by you being here um, it's because you want to be a part of um, the solution a part of the change that we're all looking for um, so my name is Sydney and I'm the vice president of um, the black student union on campus uh, Riley here um, Riley happy she is the president of the black student union and um, I want to start by um, saying that we created the Black Student Union because we noticed that um, we were underrepresented on campus and we wanted to create a safe space for us to have a sense of community and to come together um, and give our group a voice. Um, and that would not have been possible if we did not, um, if we wouldn't have joined Black Scholars first. Um, because there is a need for community um, on campus because there are so few of us. So I want to shout out um, Alexandra Evans. I believe she's on this call um, for championing that for us. And then also David Crawford, um, who works in the Multicultural Center with Hoover, um, who also has, uh, there are advisors and they've been an integral part of um, getting BSU up and running and giving us the, the support we need so that we can uh, provide that sense of community um, on campus and um, push change forward um, as best as we can. Um, I want to um, start by um, just addressing a few things. So taking a step back um, to talk about some of the things that were discussed um, during this um, presentation that Hoover just did, um, just to kind of provide context and also, you know, elaborate on things um, a little more. So um, excuse me, I took notes. Uh, Riley, also feel free to chime in. Um, she was taking notes as well. So um, one thing that I want to address first, because a lot of people don't, we use the term racism all the time. Um, we use the term, you know, white supremacy and oppression and systemic racism, all these things all the time. And I'm not sure that people fully understand what those things mean and how they work together. Um, but specifically for racism, that is, uh, yes, race is a social construct, but as it exists, it is um, a way for the dominant group, which um, in this case are um, the majority white people, um, and a power construct that they use, um, as you mentioned in the critical race uh, theory, um, the power construct where um, it shows up for uh, the subjugation of people for their political, economic, and social benefit. Um, and the reason why I think people have such a hard time discussing race is because in order for, I mean, and when I say people, I don't mean uh, black people and I don't mean people of color because we talk about race all the time. We don't go a day without discussing race, without being aware of our race, you know, from whether or not I'm going to wear a certain purse when I go out because if I go into a store, they're going to be watching me. It shows up in every single thing. Every, every way we move through life is with our race as consideration. So when I say that people have an issue talking about race, I'm referring to um, white people and white adjacent people. And um, the issue with be, um, speaking about race is in order to admit that someone is being disadvantaged due to racism, you also have to acknowledge that you are being advantaged based on their disadvantages. If they're being subjugated or oppressed, you're benefiting from that oppression. 
And that is why racism is not being discussed or people don't want to confront it or deal with it. Um, but I also think it's important to mention that um, racism is not a, it's not complex, but then it is. It's not as simple as saying you're a good person, so you're not racist, and you're a bad person, or all racists are bad people, all non you know what I mean? So <laughs> hopefully that makes sense, but it's not that simple because we are um, living in a society that is fundamentally racist. It is founded on racism and genocide of indigenous peoples and stolen labor and all of this. It is impossible for white people, white adjacent people, non-black people to, um, well, we'll stick with white adjacent, um, to not be racist, it's impossible. Um, so that's why there's so much emphasis being put on being anti-racist because it is in every, the way that uh, you have access to food, the way that you have access to healthcare and how you're treated by the doctors, um, the education you receive, all, all of that is rooted in racism. So in order for you to have a real conversation about um, racism, you have to admit your privilege in it. Um, you have to admit how you benefit from it and acknowledge that. And you have to um, understand how racism, along with all of these other um, system, or tools of oppression, uh, show up in different parts of our life, whether it is in the medical field or in school or in your personal lives and things like that. And then ha you have to, if you want it to end, you have to physically constantly, relentlessly do that work to be anti-racist. And that doesn't mean, say, you know, walking around and calling yourself an ally. It means literally when the cameras are off, when no one's looking, you're educating yourself at every turn. You're reading about it. You are studying the true history of um, how all of these systems came to be and working to dismantle them. So I think that that's a very important point to make. Um, Riley, do you have anything you want to expand on that before I move to my next uh, note? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, you know, Sydney, you touched on something really important when we're talking about racism. It's not just traditionally white people that you would think of as white that benefit from racism. You mentioned a very important term, um, white adjacent, and I want to touch on that for a bit. Um, talking about race is uncomfortable for most people. But it is something that as Black people, we have been made uncomfortable because of our race. This social construct that isn't real, right? It's made up and yet it's so heavily enforced and it is systemically inlaid in every level of our society. And when you're talking about racism, you need to recognize your part in racism, just like Sydney said. So being anti-racist extends far beyond what happens in the classroom or what happens when the cameras are rolling. There are more than just white people that benefit from racism. And myself, you know, I benefit from something called colorism. There are so many aspects and different levels of race and what race was said to be. And, you know, it's, it's important to look at the black experience as, as well when you're talking about racism and separating black people from people of color is another distinction that I wanted to touch on. Um, when you are talking about racism, black people and people of color in general experience two different things. There are racist or prejudiced acts within the group um, of people of color as a whole. Black people have been discriminated against and harassed by other people of color as well. When you're talking about racism, it is multifaceted and there are several different aspects within each group that is perpetuating the racism. So that's that's something I want to mention. But um, yeah, I, I think what Sydney is saying is very important and, and realizing privilege as somebody that is white adjacent or uh, white passing is another term that should be looked at, right? So maybe certain people are, you're mixed or people are Armenian or there are so many different ethnic groups that could be considered white from a glance. Darker skinned black people don't have that and will never have that. 
and my friends that are darker skin have had this talk with their mother about here's what you do to avoid white people here's how you can be non-violent in a store here are the ways that you need to act and pass to survive and white aligned people or white passing people will never have to experience that so that's just something i want to bring up as well thank you riley um yeah so basically just in with everything going on uh, right now, and I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later, but with everything going on right now and everyone who's wanting to, um, because we've had, you know, a lot of people reach out um, wanting to help and be um, an ally for, um, you know, BSU or just in, as friends um, um, in our personal lives. And I wanna emphasize that if you really truly want to, you know, stop um, what's happening, which is, you know, the murdering of black people across the board, men, women, transgender, gay, across the board, then you have to do the anti-racist work. You need to check your own bias, your own anti-blackness, and you need to speak up. That means that if your family is saying something that is problematic and racist, you need to address it. And I don't mean address it from the stance of, you know, this is the time not to center black people when you're talking about it. You need to center why this system exists and how you benefit it, how you benefit from it and how you are going to do the work to fix it. Not centering, oh, well, black people are, you know, it being murdered and things like that. I guess that's a topic of conversation, but don't spend all of your energy focusing on that when you really should be focusing on how you know you how you've been complicit i guess is what i'm trying to say um so i hope that that lands and that makes sense to everyone um but uh, that's the main part of you know being able to um, dismantle these systems that benefit from our oppression um and i also want to address something that um may have you know, inadvertently been done during the sideshows, which is referred to um, colonization as a, um, a past tense um, thing. And I want to be very clear that that is something that has never ended. The very fact that we are in education systems that center whiteness is, in a, is in a testament to how we are still operating in this colonized environment, society, and uh, country. And to highlight that even further, I wanna point out that um, even within student government, there is a lack of representation of black people. Within GCC's faculty, there is a um, lack of representation of black, um, faculty, especially tenured. And even within subjects that are um, supposed to capture the nuanced experiences of um, people of color and black people, there are no black people teaching those classes on campus. So it's things like that. In addition to when you're taking English classes and they're focusing primarily on white authors, when you're taking culinary arts um, classes and they're spending the majority of their curriculum on um, European cuisine and spending maybe a few days or a week on ethnic cuisine, when um, you are studying art and it's all European artists, everything within our curriculum at GCC, and this is something that needs to change, is Eurocentric. And I find it also very interesting that all of the curriculum is based on contrib contributions of non-Black people uh, within America, but also outside of America. However, there is little to no mention of Black American people who have contributed to these same fields of discipline. So when we are having these conversations about what change needs to happen, we also need to be able to differentiate between what is performative and performative is words 
and non-tangible things, solidarity with no action, and transformative. And what we need to see at um, GCC that will benefit everyone, not just us at BSU or the Black students on campus, is transformation. There should be no reason. There are resources everywhere that Black people are part of every industry and have contributed to every field, especially the medical field. But we don't show up. And I think that a bigger question, especially for the leaders on this, this um, call, because I think I see Dr. Vire here, is why is that? Why, why are we so underrepresented in all of these fields of discipline? So you can't really have a conversation about all, with all due respect, with all of the things that um, GCC is doing without acknowledging that it's rooted in white supremacy, systemic racism, that's just a fact. So you have to, yes, we need to create certain spaces for ourselves, which I know we're working on, and we need to put forth initiatives, but we first have to acknowledge that it's rooted in white supremacy. We have to acknowledge how even events like what happened with George Floyd, how that was able to even occur and how those systems that create that environment for police to do things like that also are upheld by the same systems that put uh, white supremacy or make up white supremacist schools in our environment. So we have to be realistic and honest, even if it is uncomfortable. And in being honest and addressing these, and listening to the people who are oppressed don't center whiteness when we're talking about issues that are affecting our community even and again this is i'm sure well intentioned but even in speaking about all of the positive or the few positive things that are you know going on in the communities and all of that there was no mention of what's happening right now. We are in the largest civil rights movement in American history that is responding to the pandemic of police brutality, the murders of black people. And even in this call that's meant to address racism, and I understand it's meant to address it across the board, we hadn't even brought that up. And that is mind boggling to me, but it also points to the issue. We need to be able to speak about these things. And when black people are speaking, we need to be heard and not written off as being argumentative or aggressive or angry because it's not anger. We are tired of attending diversity and inclusion phone calls. We are tired of seeing reforms that lead to no improvement. And I'm also, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but I'm just gonna say what I need to say because and then I'll <laughs> move on if Riley has something to say. But I'm also, I want to just be real for a second. These issues that are happening are not due from, a, are due to a lack of education. It is due to willful ignorance, willful blindness, because it's more comfortable to turn a blind eye to what is happening. We've seen it on the news, all of this. We, we've heard it in the classroom when teachers are freely using the n-word on campus and no one says anything because it's more comfortable to sit and treat it as that's their problem and i'm i am being specific with the n-word being used in a classroom at gcc microaggressions on the daily so it is not due to a lack of education it is complicity and if we're going to move towards change, if that's really what we're doing here, we need to be honest about that. Okay, Riley, did you wanna say something? Thank you, Sydney, first of all. Um, and I'm sure for a lot of you, that was very uncomfortable to sit through. But I think we have to ask ourselves, 
why am I uncomfortable in these spaces, in these talks, where we are talking about race and we are talking about heavy subjects? And when you're talking about racism, Black people should be centered as well. When you are creating events and healing circles and educational you know, lectures about racism or about George Floyd or mentioning things that are happening right now, like the Black genocide, we are in a genocide. Black people need to be centered. I'm tired of receiving emails from people at GCC conducting healing circles for Black people without being mentioned when you're not actually targeting Black people. Your demographic is being skipped over and then we are having these healing circles or these lectures that aren't for us, but are talking about us. We need to be centering Black people in issues concerning Black genocide. And we need to be asking ourselves why it's so uncomfortable to do otherwise. Thank you. Um, so I wanna take a second to, you know, tie this back to the students, the black students on um, campus. Um, I will say that these past few months um, have been especially um, taxing, considering how we, um, our community is disproportionately affected by COVID. But on top of that, adding the racial trauma um, with George Floyd and the countless, I believe there um, have been over 100 people who have been killed since then, Black people. So adding that on top of it has been devastating. And so BSU has been, you know, actively reaching out to the Black students on campus. And um, we, uh, thanks to Alexandra and David, um, we were able to do a um, healing circle of our own for our community to talk about what we're experiencing. And I just want to put this, um, I want to um, put this into perspective for everyone, is that when you are witnessing someone being killed because they look like you, and you have to make peace with the fact that it is by the grace of God alone that you're still living, that takes a toll on your spirit and then expect it to turn around and turn up for school and succeed and be held to the same standards as everyone else is rough. And in checking in with ourselves, because of course we're living this as well, but checking in with these students, as a collective, this, the things that I've heard across the board are not sleeping, you know, loss of appetite, not eating, depression, bursting into tears in the middle of the day, because we're having to, because of all of this, and then still um, having to show up because our grades will be affected. And I want to also echo that this is not just the students. For the few black faculty or staff members that you do have, they're experiencing this too and they still need to show up. And at the cost of our collective mental health, because even within this context, we are dealing with blatant racism, biases, microaggressions. Um, I wanna share that even in one of my classes, I did not want to go to class. This is when everything started happening and I couldn't even wrap my mind around how I was going to focus on school, um, let alone process and heal from everything that's going on. But I go anyway, because I don't want to be penalized. And my teacher opens up the floor to discuss um, what's going on uh, with the protests and everything and George Floyd. Um, she's not a moderator, um, didn't facilitate the conversation whatsoever, did not read the room to see that I was the only black person in the class, which is the experience of many black people, if there are uh, the few black people that are on this call, which left me open to more racial trauma as I am defending myself back against the wall while all students are coming at me, trying to make me answer for everything that's going on, ignoring the fact 
that we are literally watching our brothers and sisters being slaughtered. These are the experience that GCC's black students and faculty have to deal with. So I want to put that out there that the change that we want to see is in the structures and the environments that allow things like that to happen. Number one, there's plenty of changes and there's a list <laughs> that we want to see at GCC, but in order for an environment uh, or for those things to happen, the environment has to be there and it's thriving. The anti-Black environment is thriving. And if whoever's on this call did not know that, you're shocked to hear it, ask yourself why and how. How have you been able to carry on business as usual when you are literally watching people being murdered by the very people who are supposed to protect? And I keep bringing this up because there is no separation for us. There isn't school and then this. It exists together for us. We don't get to separate it, and neither do you guys who are on are in administrative positions. Um, okay, <laughs> so I'm going to um, address um, also the um, protests, since that's something that um, everyone um, seems to want to talk about and it's polarizing for some people. Um, I first wanna start out by saying that if you have not attended a protest, you should have no opinion or comment about them. Riley and I personally have been on the front lines of these protests, peaceful protests, when we have been literally attacked by the police officers with our hands in the air or as our backs are turned and they're firing at our backs. So again, if you have not attended the protest, you should have no opinion, number one. Two, I would like to remind everyone, especially everyone who is interested in history, that there has been no change especially no change for black people that has not been won through fighting back and through protests. There has been nothing ever given to us, ever. And for these protests that have happened, every single group, every single marginalized group has benefited from them. From the Stonewall riots, that we mentioned earlier, I will call them rebellions because they were facing police brutality because of their identities. From the Stonewall rebellions, those were led by black and uh, brown transgender folks. Every transgender person, and I understand that these, uh, or every person in the LGBTQ plus community, regardless of your race benefits from those efforts of black and brown bodies being, um, brutalized, essentially. The civil rights movement, every single race, um, marginalized group race, has benefited from those efforts. So please keep that in mind when you are criticizing. And please keep in mind what we're actually fighting against. It is not fun to be out here it's not fun to be watching what's going on, but we are literally asking people to stop killing us. And the fact that people want to contest that is crazy to me. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, just read through some things that I wrote. Um, and then I will move along since I know that uh, we're on a time crunch. So I appreciate everyone who is listening with open ears and an open heart. And if anyone finds issue with anyone, anything that Riley or I have said, then I really want you to dig deep as to why that is. 
because you have something that you need to address. We can't fix that for you. You need to dig deep and resolve that. Okay, I'm gonna read <laughs> what I wrote. Um, so again, Riley and I have done our best to, you know, encompass, you know, what the black students and what we have been dealing with, but black people obviously are not monolithic. We cannot um, speak for everyone. So please understand that uh, the experiences and things that we're sharing are from our perspective and things that have been relayed to us. Um, I want to emphasize that um, for the people who are, um, you know, wanting to be allies, as I mentioned earlier, that um, we appreciate the sentiment of sympathy and um, prayers and all of that. But I want to be clear that that is um, that does not save our lives. Doing the work and the anti-racist work um, does, and being active in these movements does. Um, so please continue fighting. And if you are unsure of how to do that, um, please um, do the research. There's a ton of literature and things out there. Um, let's see, I talked about that. So I also want to highlight that in light of everything that's going on and that has been going on because this movement is not new, it's been going on it really has never ended, but at least for uh, Black Lives Matter, it's been going on for um, years. It's just the protests are the culmination of that. Um, and there are people from all backgrounds um, standing with us, and I appreciate that. Um, but again, that work happens offline. Um, we are literally witnessing history right now. We are the largest civil rights movement in American history. And lawmakers, school officials, and those that are in the position of power are putting their own amb ambitions to the side and are being courageous and taking action to ensure that they are on the right side of justice and to bring us all a system that we deserve and will benefit from. I will say that up until this point, it is um, recognized that while um, there have been some efforts by GCC that the solidarity even in the letter addressing um, what's been going on with the um, protests have been um, problematic in some respects, but also um, performative at best. So we challenge everyone here, especially those in leadership positions to do better. Um, on behalf of Oh, sorry, before I say this part, I also want to just highlight the fact that um, in light of systemic racism and all of that, that the food pantry was shut down at Glendale shortly after the protests occurred. And that was very intentional. And it makes no sense as everything is opening up why they're still shut down. So I would like to request that you guys open up the food pantries. No one is in danger or at risk of anything. Stop depriving people of the resources that they need and stop trying to villainize these protests. Okay, so on behalf of BSU with the support of faculty and staff, we will be circulating a petition that will ensure the dismantling of systemically oppressive structure that is GCC and decolonizing our faculty, our curriculum, and other measures to ensure that we have a healthy and safe learning environment for all of us. Um, so with that being said, we are trying to do change GCC from the inside out um, in a way that will positively benefit all of us. And I look forward um, as a member of BSU and as a black student on campus of um, being able to see that through. Um, I'm. Thank you for your time, everyone. <laughs> Riley, if you would like to say something. I'll, um, I'll just turn it over. I think what you've said is more than enough. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Sydney and Riley, for um, your time, your energy, and for just 
being here tonight, even with all that's going on. And I just wanted to touch on what Sydney mentioned, how, you know, the work of anti-racism shouldn't just stop after the cameras are rolling. So we really need to, um, you know, be on social media, be on the news, um, be on educating ourselves. We need to take this work into our own workplaces to create um, safe and healthy learning environments here at GCC. And so tonight, um, I know we want to kind of save time for Q&A, but um, I'll be speaking a little bit about um, how we can start to do that work from a student leadership perspective on ASGCC specifically and um, discussing a little bit about what we've done so far and what we can continue to do. So Elise, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share those slides. Okay. Before I do that, I kind of um, just want to tell you guys a little bit about what ASGCC actually is. So ASGCC is the official student government organization on campus. Um, the ASGCC legislature is a group of students, six elected executive positions, and 20 appointed senators to represent the varied interests of GCC's incredibly diverse student body. And we address um, the various concerns of our students and connect the gap between students and administrators by representing students in important college-wide decisions. So um, we also, we support student groups such as Black Student Union and um, sponsor Campus Life. And if we go on to the next slide, um, so in terms of progress, we have seen a slight demographic shift in the organization over the last year. And um, here we have the um, demographics of the spring 2019 ASGCC legislature. Again, we're a legislature of 26 people, so you can kind of fill in the blanks and um, do the math a little bit there. Um, but yeah, among the various ethnic backgrounds that our students come from, we only had representation from um, Black and African American students. Um, we had one um, Black officer, um, Latino Hispanic students, um, and Filipino students. And I was, again, the single um, Filipino officer on ASGCC last spring. Um, if we look at the percentages, 3.8% um, Black or Afri African American, 3.8% Filipino, 15.4% um, Latino or Hispanic, and um, at 61.5%, over half of our legislature identified as Caucasian and Armenian. And if we go on to the next slide, we can see um, you know, we've made some progress in more accurately representing our student body, but we are still lacking major represent representation of students that come from other ethnic backgrounds. And um, it's important to note that we had no Black or African American students in our legislature this year. And at 51.3%, still slightly over half of our legislature identified as Caucasian or Armenian. And, you know, this is just the first example of the work that still needs to be done surrounding diversity and inclusion um, in ASGCC specifically. And these next few slides um, will be a sample of the results from our campus climate survey that Hoover was mentioning, which was administered, um, I think, yeah, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And the semester student representatives on the Student Affairs Committee shared these results with the rest of our legislature. And um, so, 3,000 of our students responded and pretty much shared their feelings about the racial environment here at GCC, which um, was really important for us to look at as student leaders whose mission is to ultimately um, create a sense of belonging for students here at GCC. So if we go on the next slide, um, we can see some questions and results from the survey. And what I wanted to point out most in this data is that Black students um, consistently reported higher feelings of racial segregation here at GCC. Um, and then the next slide, this next question, um, have you experienced or heard about the following happening at GCC? Race-based physical attack, race-based verbal attack, race-based physical aggression, um, for example, being bumped into on purpose. Um, again, among all the ethnic groups taking the survey, hearing race-based verbal attacks at GCC, again, want to emphasize at GCC was reported um, the most by black students. And then if we go, um, to the next slide, we can see, I'm sorry, um, I'm kind of running through these really fast uh, for the sake of time, but um, we can see that this trend continues with um, black students overwhelmingly being assumed to be um, a natural athlete and or a member of a sports team or um, hearing jokes related to race that have made them feel uncomfortable. And um, if we go on to the next slide, 
um, these last couple of questions um, I want to um, sit with for a little while. So has the overall racial environment on your campus resulted in any of the following? Increase in your personal motivation or activism to make change, decline in your academic um, performance slash grades, decline in your physical health, um, and then the second question, has the overall racial environment on your campus resulted in any of the following um, decline in your emotional well-being, feelings of frustration and or anger, um, feelings of loneliness, not belonging and or isolation. Um, and, you know, um, again, higher percentages of black students report um, a decline in academic performance slash grades, um, feelings of frustration and or anger, and feelings of loneliness, not belonging, and or, as a or, and or isolation as a result of our racial environment at GCC. And this is kind of just, um, Sydney and Sydney was so great, was generous enough to um, kind of share her experiences. And um, I think these, these results kind of just solidify that notion that these things are still happening at GCC. There are certain student groups, um, especially our Black students, um, that feel unsafe at GCC, again, as a result of um, our racial environment at GCC. And as a legislature, we were looking at these results and we recognize that this is where we need to come in as student leaders um, to you know, step up and to advocate for the over, overall well-being and success of our black students, but also um, so many of our other students from underrepresented ethnic groups at GCC. And um, yes, next slide. So we've done a few things. I um, don't wanna to forget to highlight what we've done so far far. Um, so this semester, um, we adopted a new ASGCC activity model for our educational events, where we outline our priorities and goals for um, our student activities programming. So in other words, social and educational events hosted by and for students, as well as our larger campus community. And through this model, we decided it was really important to prioritize equity, diversity, and inclusion as one of our learning objective, objectives, sorry, for these educational events. And it would be, you know, it would be impossible to represent the interests of our diverse student body without events centered around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this semester, we um, made a tiny step forward by hosting the college's first Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration in collaboration with cultural diversity and Filipino cultural programming. And um, as the only Filipina American on this year's executive team and being part of an underrepresented group here on this campus, um, it was really important for me to get this type of programming going and hopefully set the framework for other culturally relevant programs programming for, um, for our student body. And in addition to our events, all ASGCC officers were required to attend the college's equity and inclusion training this semester. Um, again, as student leaders, it was, um, we felt it was important for us to familiarize ourselves with what equity, diversity, and inclusion truly means. Like Sydney was mentioning, there's a lot of terms that are being thrown around, but sometimes there's no real um, deeper understanding of what those terms mean and how it plays out in our communities. Um, so, and then we also saw that slight demographic shift in the organization over the last year. And if we go to the next slide though, um, with all of that data from, you know, these last several slides and even with um, the things that we've started to get going on ASGCC, you know, it's really clear that there's so much more work that needs to be done on this campus at um, all levels of leadership. And as for ASGCC, it's, um, I think it's really important for us to expand upon our cultural programming by working more closely with student organizations such as Black Student Union and GCC Familia, um, because, you know, as it stands, we don't have a lot of that representation on um, our leadership. So we really have to, um, kind of, you know, be in touch with what those students actually need um, in order to develop culturally relevant and sensitive events that foster a sense of belonging for students on campus. Um, we also need to, um, again, we need to listen to um, and center and amplify the voices of our underrepresented groups on campus, um, especially the voices of our Black and African American students, given the results from um, that campus climate survey that we all saw. And one way that can be accomplished, um, and the most 
important area of improvement for uh, our organization, in my opinion, is to really analyze our recruitment and selection processes. So are we actively reaching out to those student groups that are not currently being represented on student government? Um, you know, what communication plans can we develop with those student groups um, so that they're informed when our applications open up or um, how our um, interview processes work? And, you know, by no means is this a comprehensive list of what we can do as a student government, but this is what we can kind of just get started with to, to create a more racially inclusive environment for our students here at GCC. Um, and yeah, that's um, the end of my presentation. I'll try to make it as fast as I can. Um, I just wanna thank you guys again so much for um, tuning in tonight. And um, if you wanna stay connected as we continue to push for this progress at GCC, um, I've, I think I put down our website down there. Yeah, glendale.edu slash AS. That's the ASGCC website. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at as.gcc and you can also follow our Black Student Union on Instagram at BSU underscore Glendale. So yeah, whenever we're ready, we can do um, a short Q&A. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. I have the uh, questions and I'll, I'll be uh, directing them to specific individuals uh, on occasion. Um, the, the first question is actually for the panel. Um, the Deconstructing Racism series has been both appreciated and necessary, but to some may be seen as reactionary. What measures are your organizations or the college as a whole planning to take to continue this dialogue into the future? Do you, I can uh, try and answer at least partially. Um, I don't know if it's reactionary. I think a lot of people on campus felt like we have to do something and it was only one step, and that's a small step. Um, if I, if we have more time uh, after questions, there are a list of recommendations of what we are supposed to do. So um, as far as a campus, uh, the things that were being mentioned by Sydney, some of those things happen on campus, but not in a coordinated or organized way that is communicated to students. So it happens here, it happens there, but it can't be that way. It needs to be the whole campus, our whole system of education, not just classroom, outside of classroom, everywhere. So I don't know if it's reactionary, but it's definitely needing to address the issue in some way. Um, or form, and it's not to say that this is the end all. It's it's a first step, tiny step that needs to continue. Can I, can I just add the the person who asked the question sent me a, a separate message saying that it, the question was not intended to be confrontational. Um, he was frankly concerned that what would happen once COVID was over is that the, that we would return to old ways and that yeah. things there wouldn't be sustainable change. So. No, I wasn't taking it like that, but I think I can see how people may think of it in that way. But yeah, no, that's fine. Sorry. Moving on to the uh, next question. Um, Hoover. Uh, uh, let me, that's a long one. Let me read that one. Actually, um, Hoover, uh, what is the STAR program at the college? I've heard it works with local schools. Um, that's one of the things I ran out of time. I apologize. It's literally uh, called Students Talk About Race. And the concept is that we train our GCC students in um, this program, which has a set uh, lessons for uh, eight weeks, and we place them at our local middle and high schools and in teams of two or three, hopefully diverse teams. Students go once a week for eight weeks to the same classroom, and they discuss issues related a lot to obviously race and prejudice and how to interrupt racism and prejudice, not just 
learn about it, about gender and stereotypes of race, gender, etc. So it's designed to get students in the middle and high schools to talk. And the facilitators, the college students, actually learn facilitation skills on how to do that. So we train them before we match them to a, a class in the community in one of the schools. So that's one thing that we've done for, gosh, like 20 years. And we have uh, not many schools actually that are participating in it. We should have more, but hopefully now um, we will have more. We reach out to all our high schools, middle schools, uh, local Glendale, not just Glendale, but Los Angeles area close by. And we normally get one or two interested schools. That's usually the max. So we'll see uh, how that will go. But we plan to continue it in the future. Thank you. Kayla, were, did you have something to add to that last question? I apologize. No, oh, I'm good. Okay. Uh, the next question here, uh, oh, that's a separate one. I'll email you, Hoover. Um, thank you so much for talking about the many terms that we use to label people from around the world and that they are actually imprecise and culturally and geographically based as they are Anglo-centric, meaning that labels that we were given labels such as Middle Eastern due to our location in relation to the West rather than where they're actually geographically located. As a result, many folks from these communities advocate for the use of the term SWANA, which stands for Southwest Asian and North African. What is your take on the use of this decolonial word in place of the Middle East? And why do you think we haven't adopted it more widely? Do you see GCC adopting decolonial language to refer to our members of our community, including SWANA and beyond? Actually, one of the USC recommendations, the questions that Kayla was uh, talking about, is to do that, is to look at our curriculum and see where we can uh, work on injecting um, learning about race and racism, but also examples of what uh, was shared in the question. Um, personally, I like new terms that are more descriptive of people. So I have no problem using that term. Um, the only problem I foresee, which is obvious, is um, whether the general public will catch on. But you know, that comes over time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I am more for identifying as people want to be identified. So one thing I didn't share is in the Middle East, people usually identify with their culture or subculture of a culture uh, or their ethnic background. So they don't necessarily identify as a nationality, but more closely with culture. Uh, when I was in, I was born in the Middle East, quote unquote. Um, I never heard the term Middle East until I came to the United States. So we didn't think of ourselves as that. So it means nothing to me. Um, I would say I'm Iranian, Armenian, American. That's how I identify. Thank you. I have a couple more questions here. I've heard that other college campuses that at other college campuses, they create spaces where only faculty, staff, students of color can come together and talk. No people of white descent. Do you see GCC doing something similar? Do you think that can be healing? I can address this one um, if no one else has anything to say. Um, uh, definitely, so we had, we had um, one weekend where we had two healing circles, we had a community circle for allies and we had um, a healing circle specifically for our black students. Um, and I, with a, with a licensed black therapist, and I think having more of those, we've been kind of doing these healing circles um, as kind of um, 
an open space where people can discuss everything that's going on, um, everything that's being covered in these lectures. But um, I think we do need to continue that work and continue to provide healing spaces and just mental health resources in general for um, specifically our, you know, our Black students and our other, um, and our Black faculty and staff, and then our other faculty, staff, and students of color. So yeah, I can definitely see um, GCC doing something similar and kind of continue and expanding, continuing and expanding upon that work. Um, I have one last question and then uh, uh, just a comment about tomorrow's session. Um, are there any future plans to involve the BSU in leadership decisions? Um, leadership decisions could, could that be clarified a little bit? I, um, I'm waiting for a follow up from the person who asked the question. Um, uh, certainly, in, uh, um, I'm answering questions tonight, but I'm the division chair of social sciences. And so, um, <laughs> for what it's worth, I, I, I would certainly invite it. Um, uh, having conversations about how to do and address some of the things. Uh, tomorrow's talk, obviously, the intent was to wrap up this first lecture series with the understanding that this was going to be the first of many efforts by uh, the college to try to address the issues that are going on in the country right now. Um, it'd be foolish to think that we could address everything in one shot. Um, in fact, it would, it would, it would be hasty to, to rush and, and raise topics for which we may have not had enough time to prepare. Um, one of a, a lecture series that will happen in July, I've actually reached out to a faculty member who's doing his dissertation on police reform, and we'll have a session that's directed specifically at that. Um, defund, reimagining, you pick your, your choice of phrase for what to do with the law enforcement, but we'll have a separate conversation about that, and we also have activities planned into July as part of a month called Justice in July. Um, we understand that that's supposed to be a movement entitled Justice for June, excuse me, Justice in June, but we will continue um, again to try to make efforts to to have conversations so that we can sustain them and address different kinds of change. Um, based on the, the the batch of questions that we received so far across the last seven days, um, my understanding is that there are roughly about 60 or so folks that have attended most sessions of this series. Everyone else has only been able to come in for parts of it, and so things may get missed. I'm going to highlight a few things. Uh, we'll talk about within group differences tomorrow night. We'll also talk about um, forms of community and tomorrow we're gonna look at athletics um, just as one example. I understand that there are many more and we will look at them um, as the weeks come forward. And then we'll try to round out the presentation tomorrow night by looking at uh, quote unquote soundtrack for resistance. So um, I, I encourage uh, everybody if they are available to come and join us uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll follow a very similar format. Uh, and of course, if you have any other questions that we were not able to get to this evening, uh, please feel free to send them here. I see that Hoover's also posted his email address there in the chat. Uh, and uh, Kayla, I believe you may have additional before you wrap. Thank you. Yeah, Elise, you can go ahead and close. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. I know that this was a really heavy um, topic of discussion. Um, and as people have mentioned earlier, we will be having a, a healing circle tonight at um, tonight immediately after this. The link is in the chat. Um, and I just personally want to thank everybody for engaging with us tonight. And I want to uh, especially thank our speakers, Kayla, Sydney, Riley, and Hoover. Um, as uh, Professor Dulai said, if anybody has any additional questions, um, as well as questions that have not been answered tonight or in any previous nights, um, we will be addressing them tomorrow night as well. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody for joining us and please join that healing circle if you would like to discuss.